My name is Roy Lilly. Uh, I'm a former NHS Trust chairman and now I write and broadcast on healthcare and I've been here all day <laughs> chairing some fascinating uh, sessions on really where pharmacy finds itself, community pharmacy and really uh, looking down both barrels of a, what could be a pretty bleak future I think. I think pharmacy has to really rethink its offering. I think the days when it was the purveyor of the pills and the high street and so on, and a bit of advice over the counter, I think that's probably over. It's very hard to see how the retail model can sustain itself. I mean, we know that that uh, rents, uh, rents are going up, we know that uh, insurance, the national insurance costs are going up, employment costs are going up. The whole cost pressure of being in the high street has driven out some of our biggest names. Uh, and there's no reason to think that because you're a chemist or a pharmacist, you've got some God-given right to be there. And I think we're going to see in the same way that some people now buy a huge amount of their stuff online, Amazon and so on, we all do it, don't we? And we book our holidays online and all the rest of it. We're, going to go, we're just going to look at the pharmacy differently online. I mean, it, it, it depends a bit on how GPs react, but GPs already have the technology to do electric, electronic prescribing. Do they send the prescription to the high street, to Boots, to Superdrug, to Lloyd's, or to Mr. Brown's pharmacy, or do they send it to Amazon, and Amazon deliver it the next day? I mean, I can, that's the future. That's the only future I can see. Yes, I just think that the patients will just sort things out for themselves. The NHS is struggling. Everywhere you go, the NHS says, the NHS has to change. I'm sick of hearing people saying the NHS has had to change. War from what to what? I mean, it's free at the point of knee, young or old, rich or poor, it looks after you. It's all embracing and you've got easy access and all the rest of it. We don't want to change that bit, but we do need to change the bit that's more, so it's more nimble, it's more innovative, and it's very slow to do that. And I just think that, that, that patients will just get fed up with it. It's what I call the streetwise patient you know if you're going to complain years ago you'd write to the chief executive and complain and three weeks later you've got some gobbledygook letter now they're just going to stick a picture of a dirty lavatory or a poor meal on twitter and wow you know suddenly everybody has to take notice um, and i think you know people are going to say why do i want to go to an outpatient's clinic and sit there at two o'clock in the afternoon on wednesday miss half a day's work same time as everybody else when actually you know what i speak to my grandchildren in sweden on facetime and i can't speak to the the doctor in the local hospital on Skype. It's crazy. People just say, wait a minute, I'm not going to do this. And I think that will, that will drive the change. I think it's, it's, it's how people use social media, what their expectations are in the other parts of their life, and the NHS is some kind of, I don't know, innovation-free zone. I think there is truth in the fact that not everybody can manage digital everything. I mean, my mother's 94, and I have to tell you, my mother's got an iPad, and she does emails, and she does FaceTime, and she does shopping. I mean, she's really into it. But not everybody's 94-year-old mum is like that, and I do understand that. But hey, there's no silver bullet solution to this. It's what I call silver buckshot. Uh, and so if it suits some people, it won't suit others, but the ones that we can do it with means that we can compress our costs and our time, and that makes headroom and time for people who can't do it. So I'm not suggesting you know, there is only one solution to this. I think that, uh, you know, like all things in life, there's lots of ways of skinning a cat, and, and the technology route is good for some, not for everybody, but where it can be used, telemedicine for example, people with long-term conditions, managing themselves, um, I think you know. I think people will do it. And let's not forget, we've got a huge amount of the baby boomers generation coming through, so-called silver surfers, aren't they now? But they are net savvy and they have used the internet in their work and their social life, so I think they'll just expect to do it. I think the smartphone is a really fabulous device for self-managing. I mean, not only does it give you access to your own health records and you can store stuff on there about your, you know, your own blood pressure. And I mean, every year I go to Medica, which is a big German exhibition of stuff. And you know, we, I've been for going for years and a lot of it hasn't changed very much. But in the last two or three years, you want to see the amount of stuff that plugs into an iPhone. You think, wow. You know, how do they do that? They do blood tests, they do blood pressure. And of course, you know, people will do FaceTime with their GP. Why should they phone up and try and get an appointment? It's madness, isn't it? You know, when actually, if, if the GP said, you know what, between, I don't know, two o'clock and four o'clock in the afternoon, I'll do FaceTime stuff or what have you. 
uh, you, you, you've got to understand that there are risks in it for the GPs. They've got to get used to diagnosing you know, at distance. But in Australia, they have the flying doctor and they do it on the phone. In prisons, we have telemedicine uh, looking after prisoners' health. So I think the middle classes, you know, they'll start looking at their iPhone and they're going to say, do you know what, why can't I talk to my doctor on this? Uh, uh, and, and I think they'll drive it. They'll want the apps, they'll want the access, and I think it'll be better for everybody.